Hello. So I've just uh, started a bit early to see how it works. And just let me know. I'm just going to check on my computer if the sound is OK. I turned the sound off, but we'll start in about a minute. So right now I can't really hear myself. So OK. So there's a little bit of a delay. So I think uh, we can start. And uh, those of you who are already here, thank you for joining me. Uh, if you could just look at the page, there is a chat box there. And just let me know that you're here. That's the only way I can account for. Or let me know if you can hear me OK. Um, and thank you so much for joining me, as you already, most of you know, my name is Dr. Masood Raja, and I teach post-colonial studies, University of North Texas. So this is kind of my way of uh, sharing whatever little I know about post-colonial studies with a global audience. And uh, I was going to do this through Skype, but then I realized that uh, you know a lot of people might not have access to Skype, but everyone who has access to internet and can go to my website. And if I can configure it, they can actually just watch it from my website. And my hope also is that YouTube, through which we are streaming this, uh, will probably also be able to record it. Uh, so before I start, if you are there, uh, please take a moment and use the chat box on the screen and put your name in the name so that it shows up every time you put a comment in there and let me know that you're here with us. Uh, I was expecting about 32 people to join us from different parts of the world, but I do understand in India and Pakistan, it's too early in the morning. And I think that was my mistake. I could have, and for the next time, I will do it at a time when it's your evening and my morning. But since this is the first time we're doing this, um, you know, I hope you can still benefit from it. So I'll wait a few moments, and if not, then I'll continue with the, today's uh, webinar and brief lecture about post-colonial studies. OK, so I guess those of you who wanted to join us are already here. Uh, throughout, if you feel like I'm going too far, fast or if the software is not doing uh, right with you, just send me a text and I will pause and let the delay part of the transmission catch up. So um, post-colonial studies as of so first of all, what is post-colonial studies in disciplinary terms? At least in the United States, post-colonialism or post-colonial studies is a subfield of English studies. That means that in pretty much any research university which has a large English department, there either will always be at least one or two post-colonialists. Now, these tend to be people uh, who are trained to look at either the canonical texts differently or uh, they are the ones who introduce texts from the former colonies of the world. So the simplest possible definition of post-colonial studies 
then is it is study of the works produced by the writers, artists, and scholars of what used to be former European colonies. And there is a slight distinction to be made here. Most post-colonialism scholars only deal with 19th and 20th century colonialism. And there is a big reason for it. Uh, the reason the 19th and 20th century post-colonial uh, colonialism was different was because it was uh, post-capitalism colonialism. Uh, the co colonial powers like France and England and Italy, when they established their colonies, these are new colonies, but these colonies are also established when capital is on the rise. When capitalism is almost established, it starts from the mercantile capitalism and then moves into industrial capitalism. So it's kind of a peculiar form of colonization, even though we all know that the Spaniards and the Portuguese in 16th and even 15th centuries were already colonizing America and the rest of the world. But since they were almost pre-capitalist and their drive was either to collect gold or you know, capture land, so it's slightly different. And mostly also that aspect of colonialism is covered in Latin American studies and South American studies. So most of the post-colonialists now usually deal with literatures from Africa, from the Caribbean, and from South Asia and rest of the Asian regions. And the field itself got established after, uh, you know, Edward Said published his famous Orientalism. Now, Orientalism comes out in 1977 or 78, and it was a huge book. It was a huge book because it looked at a certain aspect of European interaction with the Middle East, which was called the Orient in, in European cultural vocabulary, uh, and studied how is it that a body of knowledge produced by historians, scholars, poets, travelers to Middle East comes together to create a sort of, you know, respectable discourse, a discourse that permeates the European cultures to an extent that even without going to Middle East, Middle East people in Europe can have certain views of the Muslim world or of the Middle East or of the Arabs or, or the Arab world. And what Said argued in Orientalism is that that is not an accident that happens because there is a discourse of knowledge that creates a certain view or certain set of views of the Orient. And it's so deep that it's almost impossible for Europeans of 19th and 20th century to actually experience the Middle East the way it is, right? They always see it through that lens. And it's that lens that Said calls Orientalism. Now, it's also important to keep in mind that um, Said was one of the first major scholars who uses in one of his major works, Orientalism, Foucault's theory of discourse. I mean, actually in the preface, he mentions that he has read Archaeology of Knowledge and Order of Things. But it was the first extensive use of Foucault's theory of discourse to explain a historical phenomena called Orientalism. So for that, then we need to understand like just the basic understanding of discourse itself. And Foucault explains it at different places in his works, but roughly a discourse of knowledge is based in certain things. So there has to be a body of scientific knowledge or a knowledge that can claim a certain degree of scientificity. Then there have to be practitioners of it, people who claim expertise in it, who have degrees in it. Then there has to be some kind of institutional prestige. These people need to be associated with institutions of learning or philosophical associations, historical associations. And these are the people that Foucault would call the enunciating subjects. They have the knowledge, they have the power and the necessary expertise to pronounce certain things about other people. Right? So Orientalism 
as the discourse then develops through the works of historians, through the work, works of cartographers, poets, travelers to the Middle East, all of whom look at the Middle East within a certain imagined lens and then reproduce it in their texts. And that body of knowledge then is used on a popular level, but also on a scholarly level to see the Middle East to a point that even when you are in there, all you're checking is whether your experience of the Middle East matches the expertise that you've read on it or not. So, um, so when people read Orientalism, there are different kinds of criticisms of Orientalism. So mm, some criticism comes from the American right, uh, and most of it actually completely misreads the book and its intent. Then some criticism also comes from the left. And mostly what people indict Said for uh, is this that within the pages of Orientalism, even post-colonialist, you do not see the natives of the Middle East having any agency at all. It seems as if they are a pure construct, something constructed by the Europeans themselves. And I think that's kind of a misguided critique of Said because in Orientalism, Said's project is not to map instances of resistance. Said is not teaching us the history of local cultures or agencies. The project of the book is to explain as to how the Europeans created this way of looking at the Middle East. And obviously in doing so, then he's mostly reading the European text. He's mostly reading how they represent the Middle East. And then of course, go, goes on to suggest that that mode of looking at the Middle East is of course racist, you know, and uh, also based in certain tropes and certain belief systems that are very far removed from the real Middle East. And obviously Said wrote other works as well, so kind of indicting Said for not necessarily representing the acts of agency and resistance by the natives is kind of, I think for me, it's 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 some kind of a moot point. It's kind of like a fake criticism. But anyway, people do criticize Said for that. Now, to me, like uh, when I try to explain post-colonialism to people who may not be scholars or students of post-colonialism, I just use a rough example, a very basic example, where I, because most people are familiar with, uh, you know, uh, Robinson Crusoe the novel by Daniel Defoe. So I tell them, okay, post-colonialism is simply the same story told from the point of view of Friday. And that they get it because they know that the story uh, of Robinson Crusoe is told from the point of view of the European um, person on the island who's Robinson Crusoe. But what if Friday told that story? Would it be different? Because of course it would be mediated through Friday's experiences, you know, who lived there and suddenly this white man comes along and makes him a slave. And so that's what post-colonial to me, post-colonialism is, is to retrieve historical and cultural narratives that might have been silenced by the European colonizers. It's because after all, one aspect of what we study about colonialism is as to how did the colonizers develop a system of governance and education, which made the native cultures and people living in the native spaces, um, if not hostile to their own culture, at least disdainful of their own culture. So one aspect of post-colonialism then is to retrieve works that tell the stories that might have been silenced, that are not canonized in the Western canon. And that's what we call a retrieval a historical or cultural retrieval. So a lot of post-colonial scholars would then go into their own historiography or their own body of published or oral tradition and retrieve stories to offer as a mode of a different way of thinking or imagining or living the life. Now, if you look at India, uh, the Subaltern Studies Project, all 10 volumes of it, 
uh, is kind of a retrieval project. It's a project that says, okay, our national history is being told from the point of view of the national elite. We need to go and retrieve the stories of the people themselves, what happened to them, people who are on the margins of Indian society. So that's how subaltern studies comes to be. Now, in, in the American Academy, post-colonialism can take many forms. Okay, so initially, if you look at how the textbooks were developed and what the philosophical and theoretical leanings of the early main scholars was, it tended to be mostly people who, like Said, who was trained as a modernist. Um, and of course, he was also trained in philosophy and he's a, he's a classically trained scholar. Similarly, we have Gayatri Spivak, who translated Derrida, is a deconstructionist, feminist, you know, somewhat a Marxist as well, right? But she's the one who came up with the term post-structuralist, but she's also considered a post-structuralist. Then we have Homi Baba, who combines post-structuralism, Lacanian psychoanalysis. Uh, so all of these three major critics in one way or the other, uh, can sometimes be called culturalists. Well, these are the people who look at history and literary texts from a cultural point of view or from a linguistic point of view, and there's nothing wrong with it. But one of the strongest critiques of post-colonial studies comes from the Marxists, okay? Comes from the leftist critics who believe that abandoning class and abandoning a materialistic reading of literary texts and, uh, and cultural history uh, is, done, is done at a great loss. And so some of the good scholars there, are of course, Robert Young and, uh, you know, uh, even Ajaz Ahmed to some extent in his critiques. And one of the earlier essays was published by Arif Lake, uh, which was about the post-colonial aura and how it is kind of an appropriation by the Metropolitan Academy of these third world intellectuals and that by focusing too much on culture, you know, post-colonialism loses its material and revolutionary potential. I have mixed views on it because uh, I do use Marx and I also use workerist and compositionist Marxist. But I believe whatever is useful in, in dismantling the project of empire is good enough for me. So depending on where you trained, who you trained with, it will define what post-colonialism is to you. But by and large, basically, I go, I go with Robert Young, who, who, who says that there are certain things you can expect in a work of post-colonial scholarship. It must always have something to do with the aftermath or the time before the European colonization. It is either a response or a critique of it. It might also be tracing, retrieving, re-articulating the silenced narratives during colonialism. It might also be about freedom struggles or struggles of the post-colonial nations after they get their independence. All of this can be covered in post-colonial studies, which makes post-colonialism a really, really diverse and wide field, but at the same time a field which cannot really very easily be explained uh, or, or easily be made comprehensible to a lot of people. And it, it leaves us open to, you know, a lot of criticism and attacks. So in my classes, I'm looking for if, if someone has posted a question. If you have a question, please use the text box there to ask me a question. And I'm also keeping a track of time. So if you need more resources, of course, on post-colonialism, you can ob obviously go to my website, okay, postcolonial.net, and there are certain classical resources there, but I also constantly post new resources there and some good books to read. Of course, I would strongly recommend Orientalism. Then if you want a couple of basic books that explain post-colonial theory, I think the best book would be Robert Young's Post-Colonialism, an introduction. I have it right here. I think, I mean, it's a huge book, 
but it's also one of the best books. And what I like about it is that it kind of fills a gap in post-colonial studies, uh, especially the culturalist post-colonial studies, because it gives us a history of Marxist intervention into, into colonial thought, especially the first, second, and the third international. Uh, and so then it connects post-colonialism to what could be its original Marxist lineage. Uh, another good book is by Ania Lumba, which is called Colonialism, Post-Colonialism. I have used it a number of times in my classes, and I strongly recommend that. And that's a good book for beginners because what it does is it kind of gives students an understanding of colonialism itself. How was it justified? You know, it, there were like two major ways of looking at the colonies, right? One, some people saw it as a civilizing mission, right? Which was a cultural mission. So the idea at least, if not practically believed in, but used to mobilize resources for colonization was that Europeans themselves were a superior race or a superior or more civilized group and it was their responsibility to take that civilization to Africa, to Asia, to India. And so it becomes a kind of moral justification for that kind of colonial aggression. And another aspect of colonial enterprise was the, the Christian mission, you know, of bringing uh, you know, light to the so-called savages. I mean, you see that in Heart of Darkness in the very beginning of it, where, you know, um, the narrator is explaining, you know, how he, even though he's slightly cynical because he's trying to convince his aunt to support his venture, so he says, I'll bring, you know, light to the heathens. But that actually was a narrative that was employed. So in so many ways, one could say that it's not that the Europeans only needed the colonies, right? There's this argument in post-colonial studies. It's that they also needed this other, right? Whom they could call primitive, call less civilized in order to stabilize their own self, right? After all, how do you know you are civilized? You only know it if you compare or create some object upon which you can impugn all the things that you think you don't have because you're better. So you know, the colonial project then relies on it. Uh, there's a wonderful explanation of also the colonial mindset or philosophy. I think it's Robert Young who explains it, but I could be wrong. And in which the colonizers had two kinds of ways of looking at the natives. Okay, one is uh, what is called uh, the Hegelian way of looking at the natives. And the other is uh, Bergsonian, I mean, from Louis Bergson, the French philosophy. So the Hegelian way of looking at the natives was that they, the natives are, are just these mute brutes, right? And they cannot be trusted and they cannot be trained because they don't have the intellect for that. So they must constantly be kept under control through brute force. And so not much is expected of native and obviously there is no room in that way of looking at the natives for improvement or even offering them education or anything. So in Bergson's views, the natives of Africa and other places were kind of childlike. I mean, even idealized humanhood could be attributed to them. And there was a possibility that if they are childlike, then they could be trained through education, through didactics. And you can see these two views at play in different stages of colonialism in the world. If you look at uh, the colonization of Congo right, by King Leopold II, which is one of the worst things of examples of colonization, you will see that all he sees that land is a land from where he needs to extract resources. So there is no need to train the natives or or incorporate them into the system other than their slave labor. But when you look at the British system in India and elsewhere, uh, they do acknowledge probably some stage of their colonial enterprise that the natives need to be trained. The famous Macaulay speech and, and the Anglican and Orientalist debate was about, okay, do we let them do what they have been doing traditionally or 
shall we give them an English education and make them part of the Commonwealth, right? These are all the major debates of the colonial era and, and most post-colonial scholars write about them, talk about them. Gauri Vishwanathan is a big name. Um, her book was about the English education system in India, its, its institution and how it worked. Yeah, I think it's called Masks of Conquest, right? So that's one aspect of post-colonial studies. Um, going from there, okay, so um, since this is my first time talking to an audience that I cannot see, so it's kind of really odd for me. Um, so where is post-colonial studies now? So as far as the American Academy is concerned, uh, it's not at its height, at its peak, as it used to be in the 90s or late 80s. Okay? Because in the 90s, every department wanted to hire a post-colonialist. And uh, now it's kind of slightly petered out, but not necessarily because people are not producing uh, better works. No, it's also because uh, the field has expanded itself. You know, it has made alliances with other areas, with Latin American studies, you know, with eco-criticism. And that I see that as a strength of post-colonial studies because it is open to adopting different modes of thinking and even borrowing from different disciplines. Uh, so, so and, and is it pertinent in today's age? Absolutely. Do we need people thinking about empire, about colonialism or neocolonialism. So for example, my one of my subfields of studies is neoliberal globalization. Okay, so since neoliberalism is the dominant economic system in the world, and since it offers itself as natural and the only way of living an economic life, uh, so I made it a point in the early stages of my career to learn about it. Uh, to go and read as to how it presents itself. You know, what does Adam Smith say, right? Uh, what does Milton Friedman write about it? What do all the other prophets of neoliberalism talk about? What are their basic assumptions? And then go and read the critiques of it. You know, how does Joseph Stieglitz talk about it? How does Walden Bellow write against it? You know, how do the compositionist Marxists like Franco Berardi, Carlo Barcelona, and all these other people are writing about it. And in the end, what is it that we can point out to people in the global periphery, the former colonies, you know, the nations where we came from, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, Nepal, or, you know, if you want to go to Africa, every nation other than Ethiopia, right, was once colonized. How do we develop a body of work bit by bit as scholars that offers critiques of this huge economic system, which is not, it doesn't just offer itself as natural, but which also forces itself upon every nation on this planet, which tells these nations, this is how you must restructure your economies because it has the global institutions on its side. I mean, look at Pakistan right now. Uh, Pakistani government, every single step that they are taking, maybe it's good for Pakistan's future, I don't know, but every single step that they are taking in the economic sphere, raising taxes, raising the rate of gas, uh, bringing more people into the tax fold, right, creating uh, different tax brackets, they didn't just wake up one day and said, you know, we need to do this. No, I mean, IMF absolutely told them here is a list. This is what you need to do if you want us to extend your loan and if you want us to keep funding you. Right? So these are global imperatives of neoliberal capital, deregulation. And so people like me in post-colonial studies then go and study, okay, what is the cost? What happens when the state surrenders its redemptive functions? Right, so there's a beautiful book by John Rapley uh, called about the downward spiral of neoliberalism, where he talks about neoliberal globalization. And he mentions that, you know, there are two regimes in it. Every economic system has two regimes, right? One regime is what is called accumulated, right? 
can we make money under this system? Right? The other regime in any economic system is distributed. How are the resources distributed? Now in neoliberalism, the accumulative regime is great. If you have money, if you have capital, chances are you will be able to make more money, okay? Because that's what the system is geared towards. But it's the redistributive regime which is weak because the state no longer collects more taxes and then redistributes them through a safety net. The state has privatized so many of those functions. Okay. So if we study that, what are the consequences of it? That's what we need to study as post-colonialists. Like when the state gives up on its redemptive functions, when it stops caring for its own people and privatizes that, right? And that takes us to a second question. And that is how does a state create loyalties? Right? And that comes from actually Mumbai's beautiful book on the post-colonies, right? And this is what I'm trying to say some post-colonialists like myself do. Right. So if the state can no longer appeal to the people through good works, that means the state cannot create what is called social debt. Right? How did the state create the social debt? I mean, think of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all these countries where about 30 years ago, if you ask someone who would you like to work for, they would tell you for the government. Right because the government jobs came with certain protections, right? You had a permanent job, you'll get your allowances, chances are you'll get some health care and some retirement, and there'll be a symbolic value to that as well, right? And so when the government gave jobs to the people, it couldn't be very efficient. So chances were if they needed 300 people, they will probably hire 3,000 because they were paying them off. But in the process of doing that, they were also creating social debt. These people who worked for the government had their loyalties aligned with the governments because their livelihood depended on it. I always use the example of Pakistan Railways. Okay, Pakistan Railways has about 83,000 employees. If you look at the infrastructure, the railway tracks go from north to south. All along those tracks are train stations, people, from running the stations to doing menial labor, all of them, 83,000 people are government employees. Their families depend on the paychecks that the government send them, everything. Now, someone comes along like a Japanese company or a Chinese company and says, you know, this is too wasteful. You could run this entire train system with 400 people. We can make it profitable. And that makes perfect sense in neoliberal capital, right? Spend less money, make more profit, run efficient system, just privatize it. But here is the deal. If you privatize Pakistan Railway and run it with 400 people hired by a private company, you have just laid off 83,000 people. These are the people whose loyalties were with the government because the government paid them, took care of them. Chances are if someone came to them and said, hey, I'll give you 10,000 rupees, would you blow up that part, part of the train track? And they was like, no, man, that's my livelihood. Why would I do that? Right? Now you've created 80,000 people who are out of jobs and who are resentful of the government. Right? So that's why John Rapley suggests that with the rise of neoliberal economics, the relative inequality has increased. The poor are increasingly becoming poorer. The rich are becoming richer. And that people, human beings, usually have no problem with inequality. They already internalize through socialization that some people are going to have more in this world than the others. It's the relative inequality that bothers people, right? When they look around and say, okay, I work hard, I do my share. Why is it that I'm not getting anywhere? And these people who are parasites, who are corrupt, constantly keep getting richer. And it's that then that radicalizes people. So privatization of government functions, right? And the destruction of the safety net is what creates these bodies who can be enrolled 
by forces who will come and tell them, hey, you know, we'll pay you. They will just do it for the job or for a paycheck. Or people can come with a more seductive message and say, come and join us, right? We'll give you a gun and we'll overthrow this system. And when we overthrow this system, you will inherit the earth, right? And so the fundamentalist, the right-wing groups rise wherever neoliberal policies have been implemented, wherever privatization has happened without the protection of the safety net, the, the reactionary right has risen. There are private groups, violence has been privatized. There are militant groups, private groups who police the streets, who tell people what to do and who sometimes fight the state. Now, how did post-colonialism get there? Right? Simply, from coming from a study of colonies to the current global system and how it works. And then as a post-colonialist, your job then becomes, okay, what is the current system in the world? Most powerful system, political or economic. How is it being proffered to what were the former colonies or to the developing world, right? And what is wrong with it? Is there something that we can point out produce a body of work that tells the leaders or the people in the developing world that maybe what you're agreeing to is not in your best interest, right? After all, that's how the so-called third world had started in 1952, you know? In 1952, the third world wasn't a bad world, okay? In the Bandung Conference, when the, when the non-aligned movement was formed, it was one of the most revolutionary ideas because a lot of countries were getting their freedom and they decided they were not going to take sides in a bipolar world. They're not going to go to the American camp or the Russian camp. They are going to become a voting bloc in the United Nations General Assembly themselves. And at that time, UN General Assembly used to be not just symbolic, it was powerful, right? And so the powers that be then had to defend the General Assembly and then disrupt this group of 70 or 80 nations. And, but at the time when it came, third world was the alternative to the first and second worlds, right? Uh, it's no longer so. But then these are the questions also that post-colonialism asks and some of us in the post-colonial field of study deal with. Uh, then depending on your training, if you were trained as a feminist, then you will as a post-colonialist start studying rights of women here in the metropolitan cultures, but also in your native communities. And that's also one form of doing post-colonial studies. You could do materialistic post-colonial studies. And then you can you can go to any other area. I mean, environment, it's degradation, biodiversity, all of these when looked at from the point of view of people living in the global periphery in one way or the other becomes post-colonial work. Right? And then those of us who are in literature departments then go and pick up literary representations of that. You know, a novel from Nigeria, a novel by Ngugi Chiangu from Kenya, right? Uh, Emeshita from, um, you know, Nigeria. So since the stories we tell are by and large either representations of the living culture around us or an imagining of it, right? we use these literary texts not just to teach our students in the metropolitan cultures about Africa or about India or about Pakistan, not exoticizing it, but using these texts to tell the stories of what happened there or what is happening there. And on a larger scale, if you do critical pedagogy, which is also, you know, post-colonialists do, maybe if we can find some commonalities with people represented in those novels, uh, Maybe we can also create some kind of empathy for those people from the people who live in the privileged parts of the world. So all of these are some of the areas that post-colonialism um, you know, deals with. And I have a question here. Why some post-colonial writers, especially in Indo-Pak region, self-stereotype the self through texts or media? What is the importance of reorientalism? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, and it's Zara who has asked it. Uh, first of all, I don't agree with the term reorientalism because it's based in a misconception. 
It's based in a misconception that an, an, an individual can orientalize. Now, the most important aspect of Edward Said's work about Orientalism wasn't that anyone can go and say something about India or about the Arab world. No, you had to have power. Okay, how much power? Like he uses the example of uh, Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Right? That's the beginning point of his study. So you have to have the power to conquer a space and then have to have the resources and access to record it, right? That's what Napoleon does in Egypt, right? He brings an army, Said says, but he also brings about 3,000 scientists, ethnographers, geographers, and he records Egypt, records it, publishes it, and sends it back to Europe. So to really orientalize a space, you need the power to be there. You need to have access and you need to be able to record it as the only true recording of it and then disseminate it. So if Pakistani writers or Indian writers are writing something that's stereotypical, this is not reorientalization. You could call it a misrepresentation and I've written about it too. Um, I am for it and against it at the same time. I'm for it because I respect the writer's right to represent any space, any which way they like, because it's their project. I'm against it because the writers also need to understand that their works are not read or produced in isolation, right? Uh, the strongest argument that metropolitan races can offer to support their arguments is when they can get a cultural insider to say this thing. You might have noticed it. You know, when the conservative want to legislate something against women, they'll get a woman to say, well, we don't want it, right? So our writers from India, Pakistan, elsewhere also need to understand that the works that they are writing and the works that are being consumed by metropolitan readers um, when they write certain things which are stereotypical or negative about their own cultures, they have to write it in a way that they don't authenticate the prejudices that already exist. They have to write it out of luck, right? So yeah, there are things happening in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, which are terrible, right? And you have to write about it as a writer. Right? But then also give us some narratives of hope. After all, like, you know, India is a country of 1 billion people, Pakistan, like 275 million people. There must be something nice going on there as well. People must be kind and generous to each other. And I wrote about it. And uh, actually, I just posted it on my website. If you go to my publications and go to book chapters, I just posted my chapter about uh, which was published in Pakistani Anglophone literature, and it deals with this issue, right? Is our own expectations as Pakistanis and Indians of the text that native authors produce, and that that, that you know terrible um, imbalance between representation and what we think should be represented, right? Uh, so I don't know if I answered your question, Zara, but what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, what I have learned myself as a scholar in my work is to be extra careful about any claims that I make, right? So if I'm going to write something critical of Pakistan, which I have, I will also try to point out within the same body of work that this is not the norm and that while this might be bad, a lot of good is also happening because that's the story that is not being told over here. But if I just sold my soul and said, okay, you know, I'm just going to pick up every trope which Ajaz Ahmed lists them, right, in his book in theory and proffer it to the metropolitan audiences, then I think I have kind of conceded my right to be called a post-colonial scholar or a post-colonial, you know, writer. So there has to be this balance, right? We must not generalize about the metropolitan cultures, we must acknowledge if there is something good here, which I do in my work. 
and also about our native cultures, right? We must point out the ills, but trace them back to where they came from. And if they're self-generated, you know, let's admit it. But also give some stories of hope. And that struck me when I read the Granta issue on Pakistan, right? Uh, I've written about it too, because here were like 12 or 13 Pakistani artists, you know, uh, and writers who didn't even have to convince the publishers that their work is work. They were invited to write. And what do we get? We get the first story, which is about a nameless place. So it can be anywhere, Pakistan, inconsistent within its own logic, you know, a story of rape and incest, you know, magic realism, fine. But that's the story that we came up with. Dot, I'm forgetting his name. The, another story is about a beheading. So even when our authors are given the chance to like, you know, lovingly represent their own culture, they still default on the pre-established tropes. And I think there is something wrong with it because if we don't tell, I'm not saying propagandistic stories, no. If we don't tell stories of hope or stories about things that are redeemable in our cultures, and then who is going to tell them, right? So that also is a post-colonialist point of view, right? That's what we do here in America, elsewhere, is, you know, we walk into a classroom, you know, I walk into a classroom, Pakistan walks into a classroom, right? And, and we have to be aware of that. And similarly, you know, you, while you are there, when you write, have to be aware of the power of your words or ask yourself, you know, whose purpose do they serve at the end of the day, right? If you read your own writing, you know, who are you enabling or empowering? Now, it goes without saying that the critique of the nation is absolutely necessary. And I mean, I just wrote something about Ngugi Chiangos, The Devil on the Cross, which is a stringent critique of Kenya's elite system. But if you read that novel, you will realize that it's done out of love, right? There is nothing against people of Kenya in it. They are the ones who are the victims of the elite and the elite are in league with their global partners. So it's that kind of critique that is absolutely necessary and that kind of subtlety, I think that our authors need. So I, I hope I answered your question, Sarah, uh, Zara. Uh, but you, know, you can always post a comment on my website and I'll be happy to either write about it or respond to you about it. Then we have uh, Dweej and Sharma. Are you talking of author's responsibility? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking that. Responsibility in, in what sense? Okay. Okay, so the post-colonial author is kind of doubly inscribed. Okay. Whether they, even if they are diasporic, even if they live in Canada or Australia or United States, right? Part of you would be Canadian. Part of you would be American. But you cannot escape your Indianness or your Bengaliness, especially if, as a creative writer, you write about those cultures, right? You take it upon yourself to tell a story set in Bangladesh, tell a story set in Bangalore, right? Or a story set in Karachi. So you're using the raw materials of your primary culture. Now, you can't do that irresponsibly, especially if you know what the climate of reading the other is here in United States, in Canada, in Europe, Australia, right? So if you tell us purely a story of victimhood, fine, you know, or just a story of escape, fine, you know, that's a story. But I would say your responsibility also is, is to, to humanize people from your native cultures, right? As a diasporic author, or a, as an author writing in French or in English, to tell a story which no European can tell because you are privy to the basic aspects of that culture. So your responsibility then is not to pander to your own country or to pander to the Western publishers, but to tell a story which is cognizant of the fact that your words have carry meaning. They have the power to designate groups of people or sanctify previously held prejudices about those people. So can you tell a story in a way 
where you get to tell the ills of your own culture, but you also tell us what is going on, what kind of life do people love each other, right? Do they help each other? Uh, if there are resistance movements against the elite, you know, are they in alliance with groups elsewhere? These are also stories, right? But they then give us hope and they again then give us a complex picture of post-colonial cultures instead of just offering, you know, whatever you think will sell. So yeah, to some extent I am, you know, talking about, I think, um, the authorial responsibility that post-colonial authors need to be aware of because um, they cannot afford to not care about it, you know, if they really care about their native cultures, right? I think that's important. Okay, so that was the last question. I'm glad, I I'm, I hope you guys can hear me still. I'm glad it's, uh, you know, it's going okay without a hitch. So this is the first time I'm doing it. So obviously I will uh, do it on more focused uh, topics now. So let me just sum it up. So for me, post-colonialism then is a field of study, mostly in the English departments. It has a body of knowledge, like theorists that we read or must read. So you start with you know, Said and Homi Baba and Gayatri Spivak and Robert Young, but then you go back, right? You go and read your Fanon, you read Césaire, you go and read, uh, you know, what came, what, what Chen Weizhou wrote. So these are the precursors. These are the people who were fighting against colonialism and writing against it as it was happening. So you don't just say Said started post -colon. No, maybe he made it you know, something worthy of study, but the body of work goes back, right? CLR James and all. Then we borrow from French philosophy. We borrow from German philosophy. We borrow from the works of Gandhi, from Iqbal, from Faz Ahmed Faz. So all these people that we have access to through our linguistic expertise, they come to be, so they make a body of work. And the purpose then is to teach literature, let's say, first of all, which is either produced from the former colonies by either the authors who still live there or who are diasporic authors living in the West, and then trace the issues that they talk about. Now, what was colonialism historically? What were the brutal aspects of it? What happened in the post colonies, post independence? What is happening there right now? So these authors then gives a, give us these texts, which we cannot just teach ipso facto as, oh, this is the truth about India, this is the, no. We have to still read them critically and train our students to read them critically. But throughout the project is, first of all, to make our students in America and Canada here aware of these cultures elsewhere, these living, breathing cultures with literary and cultural histories. But then also maybe to train them to be, you know, slightly empathetic towards those people, not just see them as others, see them as foreigners, but as fellow human beings with whom they share a planet. So that's also part of post-colonialism, right? So it's critique of power everywhere, but also, uh, possibilities of solidarities, right? Getting to know other cultures, maybe loving our others. All of this is kind of packed into post-colonial studies. So it always depends on what you as a scholar can grasp or handle and manage, right? So in the last two or three years, uh, I've spent a lot of time on, you know, writing about fundamentalism. So I started with, you know, Islamic fundamentalism, then I went into you know, American fundamentalism. So I published a book on it in 2016. Technically, it might not have to do anything with post-colonial studies in a literature department, but it is a post-colonial topic because what it says is, how are these human subjectivities created in America? And are they any different from the Taliban, right? Next book, you know, another topic was bothering me. You know, I was reading materials about ISIS and I was like, you know, there are many books about ISIS. I want to write one in which I want to ask questions for my own education first, you know, how does someone come to be? You know, 
as someone such as that, right? And so that was a project which had nothing to do with literature, but it had something to do with text. How are these people reading their text? How are they interpreting it? The Quran, the Sunnah, right, and other books. And so it became a post-colonial project in that sense. So my forthcoming book, it's called Democratic Criticism, Poetics of Incitement and the Muslim Sacred, is yet another different topic. All it's trying to say is, picks up the Rushdie affair as its starting point and trying to explain why is it that so many Muslim felt so enraged and anguished about the publication of the satanic verses. And if we train graduate students in the American Academy, can we train them without teaching them the modes of meaning making or the meaning making processes in the Islamic world? Because you know you would not expect us to graduate PhDs who don't know how to you know, read a text within its cultural context over here. But can they manage to teach texts about the Islamic world without even knowing you know, how people experience life or how discursively their imagination is produced? I mean, not as a monolith, but in particular places. So that's what that book does. So in one way or the other, you find what's your strength so it always can be on different topics, but it deals with issues of power, right? Issues of representation, historical and contemporary. And it has to have some kind of enabling politics, right? It must enable a different way of seeing the world or a different way of reorganizing the world or a different way of reading the text against its grain, against the imperatives of power. And all of these things combine, and so that's where gender comes in, that's where sexuality comes in. All of these things in one way or the other can be classified under you know, post-colonial literary studies or post-colonial theory. So yeah, I've been talking about for about an hour. Let me see if there are any questions. Is cosmopolitanism a development? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I would highly recommend uh, Bruce Robbins and Feng Chia's uh, Cosmopolitics. Right? It's an uh, edited volume with some really wonderful essays in it. And uh, so I mean, technically, cosmopolitanism, it depends what your disciplinary training is. Right? So if you read Anthony Appiah's book on cosmopolitanism, he traces it to the sophists, right? the sophists were the early Greek philosophers um, famous for not having national alliances, right? These were philosophers who were itinerant. They will travel from one state to another. They will teach or write speeches, right? They were rhetoricians. So the idea is to have a kind of global identity which is not rooted in the nation, right? In a national identity or a militant national identity. I think what I like about Bruce Robbins work is because the, the Feng Chia and Bruce Robbins take us to Kant, right? And there is a brief pamphlet that Kant wrote, which was called Perpetual Peace. It's available online. You can download it and read it. So Kant writes it as a, as a word constitution, right? It's like it has a preamble, it has sections. So it's written like a constitutional constitution to be adopted by the world. And in that, what he imagines is a world in which there are no national identities, but there are loose connections between different groups and where everyone treats the other as equal. So the basic assumption in cosmopolitanism isn't that one has to be completely post-nationalist. Now, you can still live in a nation or in a nation state, but you have to have an outlook that doesn't exclude those who are not part of that container called the nation. Uh, so in so many ways, yeah, absolutely, a certain kind of cosmopolitanism, you know, or Marxist internationalism was beyond nationalism. Anything that tells us that maybe my sympathies shouldn't just be aligned with those who are my co-nationalists or my neighbors, but rather people of my class, 
you know, wherever they be, that's Marxist internationalism, workers of the world unite. Or I will work in solidarity with working class women. It doesn't matter if they are Indian, if they are from Pakistan or rural women, it doesn't. So that is a certain cosmopolitanistic trajectory of that kind of work. And, and you don't have to abandon your national identity. You just have to expand it to include others, to work in solidarity with them. So I think that's the kind of movement. Pretty much you, you will see there are very few scholars who, I mean, I am, I was and still believe that we do need some kind of, of a nation state. Not because without that we cannot exist, but in the current climate of neoliberalism, a national government or a national state is the last defense against the forces of neoliberal globalization for the poor. So we do need an infrastructure on a national level which does not allow global multinationals to absolutely take over a space and its people. But even that, you know, my stance is slightly ambivalent because I am not for the pernicious aspects of nationalism and the exclusionary aspects of it. But wherever it can become a redemptive force, absolutely. But yeah, cosmopolitanism uh, is that kind of global responsibility where, so the kind of post-colonialism that I do, uh, you know, I started in the traditional sense, you know, everything was a critique of power, America and Canada. And then I realized, you know, the Taliban are making the same argument, right? This is Satan and all. And, and in my life, 30 years over here, I have interacted with hundreds and thousands of decent human beings from all races and cultures, all Americans, right? So I realized I have to be more subtle. I have to be fair to those Americans, right? Who stood with us on the airports, side by side, you know, the gays, the lesbians, women, Jews stood with us, Muslims, uh, to protest against the Muslim ban, right? I have to account for them in my writing about America. So I made my writing more precise. If it's an indictment of America, it would be an indictment of US foreign policy or the politicians. It will not be an indictment of Americans, right? And that is exactly what I expect from Americans, right? My students do not generalize, not say all Muslims are bad, right? Or all Hindus are bad. Six are bad. Now, give me particular examples of who is bad and then also account for all the good, right? And that is a certain kind of cosmopolitanism where, where you are avoiding larger stereotypes, but you're also trying to enter larger designations of humanity, right? And still, you know, hoping to, you know, keep your work critical of power. So I think that's what uh, answer that is cosmic. Yeah, so that's what answers your question there. So if, uh, I think it's been like one hour. So um, I don't know how many of you joined us. Uh, Nida is here. Okay, I see her name. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, but if you have any other question, uh, please uh, feel free to post it. Um, but this is this is my first foray into it. And now that I see that this technology works, and there is about an eight second delay here. So I can see that what I'm saying over here is not translating to the screen, but you'll hear me. Uh, but if you think it's a good idea, like please go to the website, um, send me a message or just go to the webinar page and leave me your comments. And also any suggestions about future topics, like more specific, if you want me to cover a theorist or anything else that I can do. This is kind of a part of my public service and you know, sharing whatever little I know with those of you interested in it. So I would like to uh, increase the frequency of these talks and these uh, conversations and see how it goes. So I'm looking at the questions there.
Okay, so like I will, um, I'll pick up again because since Nida is here and she's an artist, um, I love her work, by the way, to, to also point out that one of the biggest indictments in Orientalism by Said was of Orientalist art, okay? And especially the, the, the Dutch painters. These were the painters who would always paint, you know, caravans and these sensual women and like men lounging and smoking their hookahs in the desert. And what Said said was that what those paintings did was they created this aura of a timeless Middle East, as if the world moved on and became modern, but somehow Middle East was caught in this time war, right? And that aspect, the sexualized women, um, the hashish smoking men, assassins and all, is what he considered a very powerful orientalist, you know, uh, form of art, right? And so as an artist then, um, I'm pretty sure Nida is already aware of it, uh, if your art is representational, uh, and if you're trying to do something with India, Pakistan, the Middle East, um, when you paint something or create something as a post-colonialist, then you have to ask yourself, okay, which pre-established stereotype does this fall into, right? Am I, you know, uh, without knowing, perpetuating a certain mythology of the East, right? I had a wonderful experience, kind of like a funny experience at UNT. A few years ago, we had a South Asia conference and different students groups had their desks there. And there was like the students from the Middle East group and I walk up there and all they have on their tables was camels, like wooden camels and little tents and all that. And I looked at it and I was like, here are people from very modern, um, you know, at least infrastructurally Arab states, like from Dubai, Saudi Arabia. Why can't you have skyscrapers there? Why camels? Like why tents? But they, without knowing it, they were still playing in the same representational tropes of the Middle East, of this timeless Middle East, which is ossified and has not modernized, right? And so as an artist, then you have to keep that in mind, right? Is what is what are you painting or what are you creating? And then ask yourself, you know, can I make it self-reflexive or can I make it uh, into something that plays with the trope or at least, you know, slightly complicates it? And so post-colonialism then in a way can also help people who don't just write literature or poems, who also produce art that is consumed and viewed and bought and sold in the global market. And that's another aspect of post-colonialism. I just wanted to bring it up for you, uh, Nida, since you're an artist. Yeah, good question about the cosmopolitanism. So, okay, so much of it, what's being written about it does fall into the Western philosophy, right? But if you read Feng Chia's work, right, they still rely on Western philosophers, Kant and Hegel and others. But that doesn't mean we can't use it. Like we can use our own philosophers. I have used examples of the concept of the historical Oma, right, as a cosmopolitan concept, as a time frame when if you were a Muslim or if you were the subject of the Muslim empire, you could travel uh, through half of the world and still speak the same language, follow the same body of law and have access to the courts and, and contractual systems. So it's up to us post-colonialists to pick up the concept of cosmopolitanism and say, okay, you know, what is Islamic internationalism? What was the concept of the Oman? Maybe teach these Western scholars, that they didn't come up with the idea, right? That they that, that a cosmopolitan, non-Western cosmopolitan world has existed for centuries. And that symbolic cosmopolitanism still exists where people from, look at the Hajj, right? Okay, it's within Saudi Arabia, but 
people from like 140 countries of the world go there every year, millions of them, right? Travel across different parts of the world, have done that for centuries, right? So yes, I mean, the basis of the debate of early cosmopolitanism as a subfield of study, maybe were here, were Western, but as post-colonialists, there is no problem in we complicating them and taking them over, right? And using them for their own purpose, just like this language that I'm using, right? I mean, it may not be the language of my ancestors, but I can use it, right? And I can do things with it, which I may not be able to do in Urdu because then it will not be accessible to the people I'm criticizing. So, um, so yeah, I agree that the basic philosophical basis of cosmopolitan studies is very Western, but there are scholars who are already complicating it. Okay, Uzma is here too, so <laughs> this is going well. Uh, Okay, so that was Uzma's question. But I do recommend uh, reading uh, Feng Chia's book. It's called At Home in the World. Uh, no, no, that's Timothy Brennan's book, At Home in the World, which is kind of a critique of cosmopolitanism. And uh, Feng Chia's book called Inhuman Conditions, which is kind of a critique of globalization, but a kind of structuralist critique of globalization. Uh, I am not a big fan of Anthony Appiah's book on cosmopolitanism because I found it to be very Eurocentric, even though he pays some lip service to Africa and others, but I, think I didn't like it. And the sad thing is it was written for a popular audience, so uh, that's to them became the biggest scholars in the field, at least here, are Bruce Robbins and Fang Chia and people like that. And those are the people we should read. I have about 15 books here by different cosmopolitanists. But those are the ones that I always recommend. OK, so like uh, I'm going to spend another just five minutes here on the screen and hope that you have any other questions. And then I do hope uh, what I'll do for the future talks is I'll gather information from all of you and uh, see uh, if there are some particular topics that you want me to deal with. And then the way I will set these up is in a way that it's my morning here, like my nine o'clock, which would be your seven o'clock on the next day in the evening. That way you don't have to wake up too early in the morning to you know, sit in front of a computer and listen to me talk all this time. But do let me know if this worked and if it's effective and if it's of some use to you because uh, you know i'll keep tweaking these things and as i said uh, you know this is my way of sharing some of you know whatever little experience i have or whatever i know uh, and may, hoping that you will benefit from it but also that you will bring me your questions so that they make me think more and maybe deliver something more focused and pertinent in the future and so I'm looking at the screen, at the chat. I don't see any other questions, but so I'll give you like one more minute and see if you post any questions. If not, then I will sign off. Okay, so it looks like uh, um, there aren't uh, any more questions. Uh, so please, please uh, let me know through the website. I mean, just go to this page that you came to. It should have comments below. Let me know how it went. 
And especially let me know what else would you like me to cover. And uh, I do need your help in, uh, you know, you know, learning some more of your needs or not needs. I mean, you're not needy, but learning some more of what you would like me to focus on for the next lectures. And also in establishing this website as an authority site. So the more of you who use it and come to it, the better it is for me. I mean, for my site and for its establishment, I think it's an important website. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we had people from United States, people from Pakistan that I know of, people from India, uh, some people from Canada. So I do hope that this group will keep increasing and you know, we'll try to figure out some other formats. But uh, thank you all so much for joining me. And you all have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening and goodbye.